we're so glad to have you here. Like I said, um, that's already kind of the first step. You guys are showing that you have a, a quest for knowledge, which we appreciate. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jean Domac, um, who's working um, on the geology side of things at the University of South Florida College of Marine Science. Uh, he's been on over 20 expeditions to Antarctica, 17 of which he was chief scientist. Uh, he's done work in Australia, Africa, Greenland, um, and many other places that I'm sure he's going to share with us this evening. Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jean Domek. Thank you, Libby, and uh, thank all of you for coming out <clears throat> on this very pleasant early spring evening. And um, I'm going to share with you tonight some of my informed opinion on the literature of, of climate change over the last decade or so and where we've been with our understanding of, of climate change. This talk is not uh, a global warming denial and it's not a global warming catastrophe talk either. I consider myself somewhere to the left of center on this and I've, I've had dinner twice with Al Gore, I worked in the oil industry, so I've seen both sides of the discussions and the arguments with regard to this, this topic that, that society is and should be very concerned about. Um, <clears throat> so let me get the clicker and move on here. Um, most of the background images that you'll see are, are photos that I've taken in my field work over the years. Um, this one happens to be a fjord in East Greenland named Antarctic Sound. And most of my work is in the Antarctic on modern climate change and ice shelf decay in response to warming. But I also work in the ancient record of, of sediments and rocks that tell us about climate transitions in the past. So this talk is going to focus on the record of carbon dioxide variation um, historically as measured um, at observatories and with ice cores, goes back several hundred thousand years. Uh, it's going to talk then about the mismatch of the last decade of climate records with the expected uh, change that we thought was going to happen as greenhouse gases, as CO2 has risen steadily and surely over that same time period. And that gets us to the question of what sensitivity is of the climate system, how we evaluate it. All right, and that's really the focus of this talk is the sensitivity of the climate system and, and our attempts as a scientific community to, to understand that. And then we're going to set back and look at some ancient records, geologic analogs that go back millions of years that represent times in the past when the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were much, much higher than what we've experienced in our lifetimes in, through the historical record and certainly through the ice core record and see what the Earth was like at that time and see what the Earth's sensitivity was like and address some misconceptions about really high levels of CO2 and how the Earth's climate responds to those very high levels. And then we'll deal with some of the explanations of this climate conundrum, why the Earth's temperature did not kept pace with the rise in CO2 over the last decade. Okay, so I had the great pleasure of meeting um, the late Charles Keeling when I gave a talk at Scripps about a dozen years ago. And uh, of course, he started this meticulous record keeping at the observatory in Mauna Loa back in the late 50s of the rise in carbon dioxide concentrations in parts per million. It's a trace gas, so parts per million is, is uh, you know, we see 320, 400, that sounds like a big number, but it's really a very small number but it just so happens that CO2 is a very potent gas in the atmosphere, even at these small quantities, in trapping the heat that's coming off of the Earth's surface. Not what comes in from the sun, but what comes off of the Earth's surface. Okay? And of course, this is the upward march of that record, again, from the late 50s all the way up um, until recent. And of course, it was in late May of 2013 when the record from that Mauna Loa Observatory first uh, poked above this level of 400 parts per million. Now, there's nothing magical about 400 parts per million. Um, it's just a convenient benchmark by which to stop and pause and see where we've been. And many in the climate community did so at that time and looked at the last decade of temperature records and said, wait a minute, 
You know, so CO2 is continuing to rise, but global temperatures have been flatlined since about 1998, 1999. So what's going on here? In ice core records, this goes back 800,000 years from ice cores from the Antarctic, and this is the parts per million, and here's that 400 part per million benchmark, and you can see that in historic time now, we've exceeded more or less the last million years of atmospheric CO2 concentrations as archived in little bubbles of air trapped in ice cores. And that's as far back as the direct record that we can measure as a scientific community of the actual level of CO2. To go back further than that, we need to use geologic archives, which are less precise, but nevertheless do give us an, an idea as to where the levels were many millions of years ago. Okay? And of course, this annual cycle, you see the CO2 going up. Okay, that's the northern hemisphere breathing. And when vegetation and leaf out happens about May or June, CO2 levels are drawn down, mostly from the boreal forests in, in Canada and in Siberia, and then start to climb again as that vegetation fall happens and we, organisms and uh, the planet, uh, remineralizes the leaf litter and puts it back into the atmosphere as CO2. Okay, now here's the problem. This is a figure that came out in, in um, The Economist, but it's been repeated in several climatological laboratories. This black line is what the temperature has been doing, uh, sandwiched within the blue, which is the climate models that capture the response of the Earth's temperature to that rise in CO2. And from the 70s onward, up to about 2000, um, the black line of temperature was within the predictions of climate models that linked CO2 greenhouse gases as the Earth's thermostat. So as their levels went up, the temperature went up. And everything was pretty hunky-dory. But then, the last 10 years, the temperature level has flatlined, and it's been so flat, at least until 2013, that it began to exceed the light blue envelope, which is the broadest um, estimate that the climatological labs predicted for where the temperature should go given the rise in CO2. And these are expressed in percentages of probability. And so this black line went beyond the light blue area, the broad envelope. And that gave the climatological community pause to think, you know, we don't have this thing figured out as well as we thought we did, right? <clears throat> and then this is a, a more refined view of that temperature record. Um, from the 1920s, a, a steady upward march, and then this flat line since about 1998. Now, there have been other flat periods in the, in the temperature record, notably um, in the 40s and in the 60s, okay? But these were explained by the climatological community as a response to aerosols emitted by coal-burning power plants. Sulfur dioxide that forms droplets of sulfuric acid in the atmosphere that dampen the incoming solar radiation and prevent it from warming the Earth's surface. Okay, and that, that fit pretty well. And as we cleaned up the atmosphere with the Clean Air Act, those aerosols were reduced, primarily in the United States and in Europe. And then the global temperature began this upward march in step with rises in greenhouse gases. And then this last plateau is what's got the community um, a little um, back to the drawing board. So let's put this in uh, the general understanding of, of global warming and where we've been with this record. Um, in the late 50s and 60s, there were a group of scientists, some very prominent ones, that said we were about to enter a new ice age, given what we understood about the last 10,000 years of the Earth's climate, and given the downward trend uh, that was seen in climatologic records, especially this event 100 years ago called the Little Ice Age. Well, then the temperatures began to rise precipitously as greenhouse gases um, began to increase. Um, as they had been since the um, 50s. And the debate, the global warming debate, began in earnest. And of course, um, most of the scientific community came on board by the end of the 1990s and, and accepted this idea that greenhouse gases were indeed forcing the upward trend of global temperatures, as demonstrated in the literature at the time. And then we entered this decade of 
of stasis, as we've talked about. Okay? And so the big question is, well, the scientific community does accept that the Earth's temperature is and will respond to rising greenhouse gases. It's the question of how rapidly, or the question of sensitivity of the climate system. All right, and so there was a paper that came out in 2013 in one of the more prominent science journals, Nature. This is what all uh, the good scientists are supposed to read. Right, Katie? Um, uh, written by some climate modelers, Kasak and Z, and their quote here I think is pretty profound. It said, despite the continued increase in atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, the annual mean global temperature has not risen in the 21st century, uh, since the year 2000, challenging the prevailing view that anthropogenic forcing causes climate warming. That's a pretty bold statement to be in a prominent science journal. And their modeling was, was, was a, a pretty elegant look at what was happening in the last 10 or 12 years. Okay, quickly, sensitivity and greenhouse gas forcing. Let's just review that for some of you um, who might want to refresh your memory. Incoming radiation from the sun is, is short wave. It's rather um, energetic, but it doesn't do much to heat up the gases in the atmosphere because they don't respond to the short wavelengths that are emitted from the sun. But when that radiation hits the Earth's surface, it absorbs and re-radiates that radiation at a longer wavelength. That's what absorption is. It's when you put your hand next to a radiator, you're feeling that long wave radiation. And that kind of wavelength, that part of the spectrum of radiation, is particularly um, absorbed by things like CO2 and methane, the greenhouse gases. So as the air levels rise, this re-radiated heat is then absorbed and it goes into warming the Earth. And if we look at the role of those gases in the forcing, that is the actual movement of the Earth's climate or radiation budget since AD 1850, the last 150 years, the most certain of the forcings are coming from greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and CFCs. Okay. There's some role for ozone, O3, that's in the higher levels of the atmosphere. There's some role for aerosols, these droplets of, of liquids that I mentioned. And there's variations in, in solar radiation. Those forcings to the right were less certain of in the scientific community. The ones to the left were fairly certain of the physics of that. Okay, so again the question is, what have we underestimated about the forcing of these greenhouse gases that has led to a stasis of the climate record? because we're pretty certain about the physics, all right? Now, let's compare the Earth's climate sensitivity to the thermostat in your home. Okay, you, everyone's operated this, right? Or the dial one, you got the dial one? Who's got the dial one, the old one with the little dial? You all got the one with the digital readout, okay? And you go there, and if your home is not zoned, and we can talk about zoning later, um, you push the button, and you put it to 72, that's a little bit warmer than we'd like. But does the whole house go to 72 like that? Okay, does every room in the house go to 72 even after an hour or two? Okay, so the thermostat in your home, in your house, when you turn that to a number, that's in how rapidly the, the temperature in your home changes, that's the sensitivity of your home's climate system to your forcing of the temperature at the thermostat. Okay, so we can consider your household climate, you know, you've got different rooms around the house, the master bedroom, the kitchen, the family room, the porch, in terms of the response time, how rapidly the temperature changes in your house. The equilibrium, of course, you punch the number in and sometimes the furnace will overshoot and then it'll stop and it'll get cool again and then it'll come up again. So there's equilibrium in response to your forcing, okay. And then distribution, okay, not all the rooms are going to be heated equally or cooled equally unless you're zoned, okay, and not everyone has every single room zoned, so that's kind of hard to do. And then there's external forcing, so if you have a, a room that's facing the south and it's got a lot of windows, it's going to be warmer regardless of what you're punching in on the thermostat. You got both ovens on Thanksgiving morning and they're cooking the turkeys away and the pie, the kitchen's going to be warm than the rest of the house, regardless of what you got here. So 
apply this to the Earth's system. You know, the South Pole, the Southern Ocean, the North Atlantic, the Arctic ice cap, okay, the Amazon basin. And then you can begin to think about the complexity of that system compared to your home. That's what we're talking about in terms of sensitivity, right? Okay, and so scientists have now come out since this last decade of, of stasis and they've defined their terms a little more carefully. And I'm not going to go through all this, but they've separated what's called the equilibrium climate sensitivity, which will be what eventually the Earth will get to if we put CO2 at a certain level, and we usually double it in terms of the sensitivity term. Okay, and transient climate sensitivity, which is the short-term response to a change in greenhouse gases. Okay, they backtrack, and this, this vocabulary has only come into the literature in the last several years in response to our trying to understand what's been happening in the last 12 years or so with the Earth's climate. Okay, explanations for the reduced sensitivity. So we are looking at reduced sensitivity, right, because the temperature is static, greenhouse gases are going up. You've punched the thermostat up, house isn't getting any warmer. What's going on? Okay. Either a slowdown in the radiative forcing due to water vapor and aerosols in the stratosphere. I'm going to dodge that one tonight. The people at MIT uh, can deal with it. I'm not going to address that. There's a protracted solar minimum around 2009. You know the solar cycle goes through a 12, 14 year cycle. The solar minimum, the solar activity, actually was dampened for a longer period than normal during the last minimum. It was less energetic for a longer period of time. Okay, that dampened the incoming radiation and took, took us by surprise. And then the natural variability as influenced by protracted La Nina phase of the Southern Oscillation is in effect. That's the most widely accepted idea, I'll talk about that in the El Nino La Nina phase or other explanations, and I'll end the talk with the other explanations from some of my own observations in working on the Southern Ocean. Okay, INSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. This deals with the change of temperatures in the tropical eastern Pacific as influenced by the cold current that comes up along the coast of, of South America and moves off as an equatorial current under the influence of the trade winds and the upwelling or the lack of upwelling of that cold water along the equator in the eastern Pacific. Here's the Galapagos Islands, Peru and Chile, and uh, the Peru-Chile current is very cold. My daughter, when we got to Vinal de Mar in 2011, she wanted to go to the beach. Okay, went to the beach, she wanted to go in the ocean. There was nobody else in the ocean. The Chileans were in the ocean. It was pretty cold, even though we were in the desert. Um, and so she got her toes wet and her fanny wet, and that was about it for swimming in the Peru Chile current. It moderates the climate globally, as it turns out. Okay, the El Nino year is when the tropical Pacific is in a warm phase. Okay, the trade winds, which blow the water away from South America, bring that cold water up from the depths, slacken. Okay, there's a pressure, air atmospheric pressure mismatch between the eastern and western Pacific. This allows the equatorial current to slacken and absorb more and more of the incoming radiation. Instead of moving westward steadily, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, okay, to a certain point. But it expands in its breadth and it expands in its magnitude of warmth to some degree over a longer reach across the vast Pacific, okay, in simple terms. The opposite, a non-El Nino year, La Nina, which we've been in more or less continuously off and on for about the last eight years, is very strong trade winds, which blow um, in this direction, which bring up this cold water from depth, okay, and not very many people swim at all in the Peru Chile current during a La Nina phase. It keeps the tropical Pacific in the east very cool. It moves the water very quickly, so it doesn't have a chance to absorb that radiation as it transits from the east to the west. And the warm water is piled up um, in the far western Pacific. Okay? Now this influences regional climates, both in South America, California, and of course in Indonesia and Australia. But it turns out there's a global reach to this phenomenon. And just how global wasn't realized until these models began to incorporate it into this last decade of, of climate records. 
So this is the paper by Koska and Z, the ones who had that very profound quote that I started with um, earlier on in the talk. And what we're looking at here simply, okay, it's a graph, but this is the years, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and 90s. These are uh, temperature records, okay, matched with models. The models are in blue for historical temperature with greenhouse gases and solar variability. Okay, so for this part of the record, okay, the blue line is matching the observation. Okay, and the observation is the black line. Okay, so greenhouse gases go up, global temperatures are going up, that model fits. Hey, everything's fine. Global warming is caused by rising greenhouse gases. Everybody's on board with this. Okay, then boom, the last decade hits, the black line, the observed temperatures, you've seen this before, is flat line. Okay. The model of historical with greenhouse gas should be going, temperatures should be going up here. They're not, they're down here. So we need a different model. Okay, so the scientists went back to the drawing board, came up with this link with the El Nino cycle. It's called the Pacific Ocean Global Atmosphere Experiment. It's a model. Okay, a simulation, that then fits the observed temperature record. The red is the, is the POGA, okay? Now, what's elegant about this is it not only explains the stasis of global mean temperatures here for this period, but it also matches the intense cold that the northern hemisphere, particularly the northeastern United States, has been experienced during, during this same time. This last February, where I moved from, Syracuse, upstate New York, was the second coldest February on record. The snowiest February on record. Okay, the year before, the NOAA climate report, 2013, broke all temperature records. It was the fifth coldest on record. So it not only explains the global stasis, but it also adequately uh, tells us what's happening in certain sectors or regions as well. And that gives the scientific community faith or greater um, acceptance that this model is capturing the proper sensitivity. Okay. Now what's important about their study is that they recognize that the, the Pacific Oscillation global warming phenomenon is controlled by that El Nino oscillation. And they admit okay, that they don't fully understand what forces this thing to oscillate back and forth. But they say it's not being forced by greenhouse gases. It's a natural oscillator. It flips no matter what the greenhouse gases are doing. And that's part of the system that we don't quite understand. And the key quote here is that we conclude that the recent cooling of the tropical Pacific and hence the current hiatus in global warming are probably due to natural internal variability rather than a forced response to the rising greenhouse gas. If so, and that's a big if, the hiatus is temporary and global warming will return when the tropical Pacific swings back to a warm state. So when we get the next strong El Nino, we should see global mean temperatures climbing back up again and responding more precisely in step with the rise in greenhouse gas, if their idea is right. And this just shows, yeah, in the last 12 years, there have been more blue bars than pink bars. And before that, the peaks in these curves, the El Ninos were much more, were larger and more frequent. Okay, well, the Pacific isn't the only part of the climate system. And so I'm going to briefly introduce what goes on in the Atlantic, what goes on in the Mediterranean, as a segue to looking at ancient climates. Many scientists have recognized for a long time that the North Atlantic circulation plays uh, an important role in climate. And it does so through, through this loop of currents at surface and at depth. Um, it's called the uh, Atlantic circulation, meridional overturning, and bipolar. Meridional overturning, that just means north south overturning. Meridional means along the lines of meridian, okay? So what happens in the Atlantic is you get um, warm, salty water making its way through uh, the South Atlantic. Okay, there's a lot of cooling and evaporation here, so the water gets, gets pretty salty. Warming in the equatorial Atlantic, 
Water gets shunted up into the Gulf of Mexico, the loop current, the Gulf Stream, and then that warm, salty water makes its way to the North Atlantic under the influence of the westerly winds. It's warm and it's salty. It gets cooled in this region of the North Atlantic, and therefore it gets denser, and it sinks as a deep water mass. And so it moves back down to the south, the down blue arrow. That's what we call the meridional circulation. Okay? Now, it's not the, bo the bottom water, okay? it's a deep water, but it's not occupying the bottom of the ocean. That bottom position um, is reserved for the very coldest and saltiest water, which is the Antarctic bottom water, which I'll talk, to, talk about in a minute. All right? Now, this is the situation because the configuration of the Atlantic Ocean is such that it's semi-enclosed. There's no way for water to get out through across the, the Isthmus of Panama. There's only a limited influence of water coming out of the Mediterranean. The, the Arctic is a fairly closed system. So it's in response to the particular geography today and the drainage of certain rivers that give us the ability in the climate system to generate this kind of a water, this North Atlantic deep water. This hasn't always been the case and when we go back in geologic time when the geography was different, okay? It's important to keep in mind. Now, one thing that's also happening is that in the Mediterranean, there is no eastern outlet to the Mediterranean. So water comes in at the surface. It's a desert. It's very dry. You've been to Italy and southern Sicily. It's very dry in North Africa. So you get a lot of evaporation, you form a very salty warm water mass that fills the Mediterranean up. And its density is derived from its brininess, from its salt content. So it spills out over the sill of Gibraltar and makes its way into the Atlantic, but as a um, Mediterranean intermediate water at a middle position. Not at depth, not at the bottom, not at the surface, but intermediate. Because its salt content makes it dense, but it's not quite dense enough to displace the cold, salty North Atlantic water or the really cold, really salty Antarctic water. Okay? Now, there were times in the past when this process was much more important in forming not only intermediate water, but bottom water around the world. Okay, so now let's go to the geologic record um, and let's see what CO2 was like many millions of years ago and what the Earth's climate system was uh, in terms of its sensitivity. Okay, so we have several things in the fossil record, in the geologic record, that allow us to measure what the CO2 was like in parts per million, believe it or not. The geochemists have all sorts of tricks up their sleeve that they can come up with and most of those methods are pretty, pretty good. We look at the size of the cuticle pores in, in fossil leaves, for instance. The dawn redwood, the stomatocytes in the dawn redwood. Um, the chemistry of calcium carbonate nodules that form in arid soils, like places like Arizona, caliche. The soils themselves, marine microfossils. The chemistry of these things and their pore size all allow us, using various methods, to look at the atmospheric CO2, not thousands of years ago, but millions of years ago. So this is 10 million, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 million, okay? Look at the numbers we're talking about. Here's that 400 level, the dashed line, okay? We exceeded that probably about 12 million years ago, and we really exceeded it on the Earth 35, 20 million years ago, when levels of CO2 were in excess of 1,000 parts per million by volume, okay? So what was the Earth's temperature like then? Well, we can't use the equation of sensitivity that we use today because the Earth's system was very, very different. Okay? And neither can we look back at those times when CO2 was really high and say, that's where we're headed to. Again, because the Earth back then was very, very different than today. We can use calcareous nanoplankton. Here's a bloom of these algae off uh, the Canadian provinces. These are very small calcareous algae, but they contain a chemistry in them that allows us to reconstruct what CO2 is like. And in the Miocene, you know, 13 million years ago, 
we exceeded 400 parts per million by volume, 12 million. This is the last time geologically that we were at levels comparable to what we measured in 2013. That in and of itself is pretty profound. But again, the Earth was a slightly different place 12 million years ago in terms of the geography and the ocean circulation. Okay. And this we can be fairly certain of. This is the Eocene 35 million years ago. Today, uh, western Wyoming is a semi-arid landscape, but are, there were large lakes the size of the Great Lakes with an abundance of animal and plant fossils all indicating warm, humid, tropical conditions across a landscape today which is fairly arid. And these are reconstructions which are pretty realistic to what the Eocene was like 35 million years ago in Wyoming and also some places in northern Greenland which have crocodile fossils and tree fossils preserved in the Eocene sediments at 80 degrees north latitude where we have an ice cap today. Okay. CO2 was in excess of 1,000 parts per million, but the Earth was a very different place. So we can't use that analogy and say this is what we're headed to. Okay, and the reason for that is the following. This is the Eocene paleogeography. Now here's that image from today showing sea surface temperatures. The Atlantic was open. The Straits of Panama, uh, the Isthmus of Panama was, was not closed. There were several seaways through there. So there was a free passage of equatorial water from the Atlantic into the Pacific. There was an equatorial seaway through the Mediterranean. Its eastern regions were open to the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. The Arctic Ocean was nearly closed. There was no circumpolar seaway between South America, Antarctica, or Australia and Antarctica. So the circulation was very different. The water masses were dominated by this very warm, salty water that formed as the equatorial currents moved continually around the equator of the Earth, getting warmer and warmer and saltier and saltier. So we had bottom waters that were warm and salty, not cold and salty. And warmer water holds less CO2, and its thermal character being warm means that higher CO2 makes the Earth warm. It's more sensitive to CO2. There's no place for the CO2 to go, no place for the heat to go. The Amazon River today, um, its biggest river system, uh, puts 25% of the fresh water supply to the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, remember, the ability of the meridional circulation in the Atlantic is tied to the salinity of the water coming up along the coast of South America into the Gulf of Mexico, up along Florida and into the North Atlantic. Okay. In that freshwater supply here, it moderates that. Well, in the Eocene, the Amazon drained to the Pacific. This is the Eocene, the Miocene. In fact, we haven't had a drainage of the Amazon into the Atlantic until about six million years ago. Okay, so that made the Atlantic even more salty to, than it was today. And because of that continuous equatorial circulation, it became warm. So the bottom waters in the Eocene were warm and salty. Okay, the Arctic was a very different place. The sea surface temperatures there were 18 to 23 degrees centigrade. That's 75 to 90 degrees centigrade. Okay. And the Southern Ocean in the Eocene, there was no circumpolar current. Australia was still attached here. South America was attached. So there was no way to thermally isolate the waters around the Antarctic continent over the pole. Even though the continent was there, you had a series of small gyres that brought warm water into high latitudes from the sub um, or mid-latitude regions. Okay, so this is where some of the geologists have it wrong as well. We look at the ancient record in millions of years ago, okay? We look at the climate history and we see the Earth has been cooling steadily from 60 million years ago. We've been building up ice sheets and we've crossed these thresholds. Here's one in the Miocene, here's one in the Pleistocene. And we look at atmospheric CO2, it's been dropping, okay? Okay, it's been dropping. So we believe the buildup of these ice sheets has been in part related to the drawdown of CO2 through chemical weathering and other processes. But we also look to the future. We look to where the trajectory of greenhouse gases are going. And that's the message that this slide is, is trying to convey here. And that is we look at where these 
Temperature estimates are going through the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change as CO2 levels are rising. Okay, and we tend, and the geologic community tends to do, we tend to then look back at these same levels of CO2 that we're headed to and see, well, the Earth was like this when CO2 was at that level. It was a greenhouse world, it wasn't an ice house world. Okay, that doesn't always work because the sensitivity in the Eocene was very different than the sensitivity today. Okay? We can't do that. The one thing I want you to remember is the Eocene Ocean when CO2 was a thousand parts per million, and we had crocodiles, okay, in Greenland, the Eocene Ocean was warm and salty, okay? So if the atmosphere warmed, the ocean had limited ability to absorb that warmth because it was warm already. And it had even more limited ability to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere because it was warm. Okay. All right, now let's look at the modern Southern Ocean, where I've spent most of my time in the last 30 years working, and I've crossed it many places. Today, the Drake Passage between South America and the Antarctic Peninsula allows the Antarctic Circumpolar Current to move continuously under the influence of westerly winds, here between Australia and East Antarctica, and here in the vast expanse of the South Pacific. So the winds thermally isolate this continent sitting over the pole. And the ocean circulation, the surface in that depth, is regulated by this geography. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let's think back about an event that, that was in our public eye not too long ago. This was the satellite view of Superstorm Sandy, which you all know did devastation to New Jersey and New York and the New England coast. And this is the size of that storm, and it's a once in a century storm, we think. You know, something like that it hadn't happened too often there along the Atlantic coast. But at the time that storm was hitting, I was in the Southern Ocean. I'm going to take a different satellite view. And I want you to think about this. Now, it's a little bit blurry because I couldn't get a nice clear shot, but here's the early stage of Sandy developing okay, off the Caribbean. I was down here, look at the circulation here, okay? Just see that, okay? Now, let's focus in on the Southern Ocean. Let's look at this storm, okay? This is a beast, all right? <clears throat> I was making this transit, now this is in 2009, but this is typical of these storms in the Southern Ocean, <clears throat> all right? This is um, Punta Arenas, Chile, this is the Argentine Bight, this is the Falkland Islands, the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, this storm, uh, we got a message from the Weather Center in, in, in North Carolina, and they said, do not go out in the Drake Passage. The waves are indescribably grotesque. So we did a weather tack for three days here, as all the other ships in the area did, in the Argentine Bight before venturing out. And when we did, we ran into this, okay? So it was still pretty nasty after this storm had passed. Now what you have to understand is in the Southern Ocean, these storms come by every three or four days or a week at a maximum, okay? And one of the ideas is that the storms are becoming more intense in the Southern Ocean, and this is adding to mixing atmospheric warmth into the deeper layers of the Southern Ocean, taking what warmth the atmosphere was trapping from rising greenhouse gases in distributing it into a deep ocean that basically has a pretty infinite capacity to absorb heat. Okay, I've numbered these storms. This is a different synoptic view. Synop means a one-shot view. This is number one, this is two, three, four, five, six, seven. They go around like a merry-go-round uh, under the influence of the westerlies. So you're parked here and you get hit by one of these storms. Three days later, a week later, you're gonna get hit by another one. Three days later, another one. A week later, another one. Okay? And these are the same size. Now, the winds are not as intense, but they're the same size. There's the same amount of energy in terms of the size of them as a sandy. So think about having seven sandies on the map at any one time. Okay? We don't hear about it because no one lives in the open southern ocean. Okay? And the storms are shunted between 
Patagonia in the Antarctic Peninsula. So even the folks in southern South America don't see these very often. All right. Now, <clears throat> the deepest water mass in the ocean is Antarctic bottom water. We're looking at a cross section from the Antarctic continent here to the left into the deep of the Atlantic or the Pacific or the Indian doesn't make any difference. The Antarctic bottom water is there. It forms in this area along the margin of the Antarctic. Because of the intense cooling that takes place in the austral winter, that water is very, very cold. And because it also evaporates, it's salty. So it is the densest water. It flows off of the Antarctic shelf into the deep basins around the world. You can go out in the Gulf of Mexico and take a cast down to the bottom. You'll get Antarctic bottom water at the bottom. You'll get it in the North Atlantic below the North Atlantic deep water. Okay. There's a lot of it. Volumetrically, it is extremely large in terms of the volume of water, particularly when you compare it to the surface layer, which is just the upper 100 meters. Okay. Now, one of the ideas that came out here is that where the heat is going in the atmosphere is the increased intensity of these storms is mixing the heat into the cold, deep ocean, and it's disappearing from surface measurements. Okay? This process is very difficult to measure because it's taking place over a vast, unpopulated region. Very few ships are there. The measurements are difficult to make. But it's a process you can appreciate if you've gone through one of these storms, or several, like I have. And there's data now from some places that says this process is indeed taking place. So we look at the places where this bottom water is forming. Okay, the Red L Sea in purple, there's a big patch forming here. The Ross Sea, okay. There's intermediate water forming here in the South Atlantic and South Pacific, basically through that same cooling process. Okay, and then there's this North Atlantic deep water forming here, all right. Um, and where that water upwells, like El Nino La Nina, it has an influence on the regional and global climate. But this is where the deep water, the bottom water is forming. Rough estimates from these studies, Journal of Climate, rough estimates of the change in ocean heat content suggest that the abyssal warming, abyssal means the deep, the deep, okay, the abyss, may amount to a significant fraction of upper world ocean heat gain over the past few decades. Okay, so maybe our stasis in global mean atmospheric temperatures is because the Southern Ocean is taking in that heat. It's a good idea. Okay. Rapid freshening of Antarctic bottom water. Okay, freshening means we're melting ice. Melting ice here needs heat. Okay, so we can observe the freshening of this water in places where we were just working a year ago. We were still on the ship. Those three young ladies there were with me off the Totten Glacier right about here. And we were interested in the freshening of the water coming off the shelf. It's melting glacial ice. You need heat to do that. Here's a heat sink, a big one, okay? <clears throat> and then decadal freshening of the Antarctic bottom water exported from the Weddell Sea. This is a study that I'm peripherally related to because some of my work is related to the breakup of the Larsen Ice Shelf that took place in 2001, 2002 in response to a decade-long period of, of atmospheric warming that has since been on hold. And uh, when it broke up, it allowed, okay, more Antarctic bottom water to be exported and to do it in a, a fresher manner, okay, out of the Waddell Sea. Okay, now the idea is also linked to what's happening at the surface. You know, you can get the surface layer of the ocean warm, but really there's a limit to how warm you can get it because the more heat you put in, you're at the point where you're phasing out of liquid into vapor. So you really can't get it above 94 degrees centigrade because you're just going to put more water vapor in the air. So this is a record of the surface temperature of the ocean going up, 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 and then it plateaus. It plateaus, interestingly, at the same time that the global mean atmosphere temperature plateaus. That means the surface ocean has absorbed maybe all the heat it can, and we've got to start putting that in the deeper ocean um, to accommodate the atmospheric heat. And if we increase the intensity of the storms because of an invigorated atmospheric circulation, that global models say will happen with greenhouse gas rise, 
we've got a mechanism to pump more heat into the deep ocean, to mix it, okay? So the quote here is um, Kevin Trenberth and others found that 30% of the ocean warming in the past decade has occurred in the deep ocean below 700 meters. The study says a substantial amount of global warming is going into the oceans and the deep oceans are heating up in an unprecedented way. If so, that would also help explain the temperature highness. And here's the data that shows that. Okay, we actually have measurements in places. So this is the surface layer in black going up, up, up since 1984, but not going up as fast in the last decade as deeper water and then the total water column depth. So it looks like the excess atmospheric heat that's not being expressed in the global mean temperature is being taken in by the deep southern ocean through increased storminess in mixing. There's a great heat capacity in that water mass. The calculations need to be done. If you do it back of the envelope, you're talking about several centuries at least of heat capacity to absorb rising temperatures in the atmosphere. Okay. We know the Earth's global climate system is linked. So what's happening with the Antarctic Circumpolar Current is linked with a mega gyre in the South Pacific. It's linked with the INSO. It's linked with the North Atlantic Maradonal Circulation. It's understanding these linkages, which is going to be the challenge for oceanographers and climatologists in the coming decade, the work that's being done at the College of Marine Science, for instance. Final surprise. Now, this was 2013. The extent of Antarctic sea ice. Now, the sea ice is the thin veneer of ice that forms on the ocean surface in the winter. And then it melts back in the summer. And the ice that's there on the continent is a, is a huge ice sheet that's a glacial ice mass that's kilometers thick. We're talking about the thin veneer of sea ice that forms back and forth with the seasons. Now, we've all heard about the Arctic sea ice disappearing. And it's going, going, it's going to be gone in my lifetime, certainly, in the next decade, probably. But in 2013, the Antarctic sea ice reached an all-time historical high, which was surpassed only once, which was this last year. So the Antarctic sea ice is expanding at the same time the Arctic ice is contracting. Why would that be? Well, if you freshen salt water, it can form ice at a higher temperature, okay? So that's one possibility. We don't know why this is, right? We don't know why this is, but it's, it's happening. Okay, <clears throat> when I first was a student, I saw this cheesy global warming film 20 years ago on Eric Barron, who was a climate scientist at NCAR in Colorado. He then went to to uh, Penn State, then he was briefly the president at, at Florida State before he went back to be the president at Penn State. And he was there and his hair wasn't gray and he was saying, well, you know, we're, we're, we're clearing off the crystal ball and we're looking into the future. And this is 25 years ago. And we're not sure, you know, what's going to happen here, but we're, we know we're conducting a global experiment. And this was before the consensus in the scientific community was that humans were inducing global warming. Well, I think we need to step back and say, you know, this hiatus, yeah, the experiment is still going on and we don't have all this figured out yet, okay? So again, this is not a global warming denial talk, it's not a global warming catastrophe talk either, but it, it says we've got a lot of work to do in the scientific community. We need people like you showing up for these kinds of talks. We need your, your support as an informed voting citizen in this state particularly. Um, and we don't have all the answers, and we need to double up in our efforts to figure this thing out. You know why? Okay, you got your thermostat in your house at 102, and you, you're pushing this button to go down all you want, and it's not going down. You open the windows, you go outside. Guess what? We can't go outside of this place. We can't. No way, Jose. So we got to figure this thing out. Okay, conclusions. Earth history is important as a geologist, okay? That's what I'm going to conclude with as an Earth historian. It defines how the climate system can respond under different boundary conditions. You know, I showed you an example 20 million years ago. It helps us understand the constraints and the legs of the climate sensitivity to greenhouse gases, okay? 
And modern deep water system is responding faster than we anticipated. It may be buying us some time, uh, but that's, you know, time is, is not infinite. Okay. Thank you. I'll take questions. So the question I, I understand is, is the use of fossil fuels increasing? Yes, that's beyond debate. We, we consume fossil fuels for our energy sources and that's causing CO2 and the other gases to go up. That's, yeah, that's. So the question is, is the deep water acting like insulation? It's more like acting like an air conditioner, I think. And you know, as the temperature in the house goes up and the temperature on the outside goes up, you start cranking on that window air conditioner and it's gonna go belly up eventually, right? It's like an air conditioner that's working off of ice or something. Yes, it's that's right. Stuck. That's right. That's right. Or it's working on the compressed gas and the compressor. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. The question is, the Arctic ice is melting, so that's causing sea level to go up, and the Antarctic ice is expanding, so that's causing sea level to go down, and they should balance out. Okay, good question. There's different kinds of ice. The Arctic sea ice floats on the surface of the ocean. It already is buoyantly supported by the ocean. So it's coming and going with the seasons, does nothing to sea level. Same thing with the Antarctic sea ice. Sea level, what you gotta be worried about with sea level is the melting of the ice that's on land, okay? And there, the key component in the Arctic, in the Greenland ice sheet, is not only the atmospheric temperature in the North Atlantic, which melts the surface of the ice sheet, which runs off and goes into the ocean and but also the temperature of the ocean water which melts the front of that ice and allows more ice to flow faster to where it was melted. And there's all indication that the temperature of the North Atlantic water is indeed warming and accelerating that frontal melt. In the Antarctic, that's a much more serious problem because there most of the glacial ice on land actually flows out as a floating shelf. That's several hundred feet thick and the ocean water can get underneath it. It can get underneath it over the size of places like, you know, the size of the state of Texas. There's an area in the Ross Sea. And there, the, you only need to change the ocean temperature by a fraction of a degree and you're going to change the amount of ice you can melt by meters. And so there, the Antarctic ice sheet is melting in contact with the ocean water, not the atmospheric temperature, which is still too cold in the summer to cause any surface melt of any significance, okay? That's making the ocean fresher. That's where some of that heat is going, and that's why the sea ice is growing in the winter when it gets really cold. Yeah, that's a good question. The question um, is, is there a single authority for, for uh, understanding what the correct interpretation of the records are? And, you know, science doesn't tend to work with you know, the gavel of a single authority or judge. It's a community. And the papers that are submitted to journals like Nature and Science or whatever are undergo what we call peer review. They're sent out by an editor with the editor's own bias and, and personality to people that they feel are adequate in their knowledge. Like an editor wouldn't send me a paper on the Maradonal circulation, right? but he might send me something on the Antarctic deep water. Okay? People that have um, an informed opinion about what that paper has in terms of its content, observations, and interpretation. And it's through the consensus view of multiple <coughs> reviews that a paper gets accepted for publication or not. And of course, once it's published, it's open to an even broader audience that can respond by writing a discussion and reply. And either the paper has legs and people get up and go with it and it's generally accepted or it's, you know, crumpled up and thrown in the circular file. Now there are some agencies like the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a UN organization that assembles esteemed bodies of scientists and many of them are on the panels I know that make these periodic reports. And, you know, that's a pretty authoritative group of people and and uh, they've had to address this, this stasis. And to be honest, in their last report, they kind of dodged it. They kind of dodged it. And that was a sign to the community that, you know, guess what? We don't have this thing figured out yet. You know, we thought we were pretty smart when 
the curves are matching in step. You know, we, you know, great. <clears throat> but you know what? It's much more complicated than that. Um, yeah. and, and, and I know we're talking about climate, so I hope I'm not totally off base here, but in, in, in the greenhouse gases um, in the atmosphere warming the, the globe, and this lovely Arctic cloud water that's cooling us off, and thank God for it, um, but it's colder and saltier. I mean, the greenhouse gases also have an effect, the absorption into the water has an effect on the health of our oceans as well. What about the, does this colder, saltier water, is there, is, is, does it have, a, is there a variability in its CO2 absorption, and could that also be helping the health of our oceans, or is it all gonna, is it still similarly dismal? We need you at the College of Marine Science. <laughs> <laughs> we need you, let's sign you up. Yeah, you know, I didn't talk about ocean acidification. Right. You know, greenhouse gases go up, CO2 goes up in the atmosphere, the oceans are going to still soak in that CO2. They're going to get more acidic, regardless of what the temperature is doing. Okay? And yes, the ability of the waters to absorb CO2 will change as their temperature changes. But ocean acidification, and as I said, you don't need to change the temperature too much to induce extensive melting of the Antarctic ice sheet. So sea level is still a serious problem. Okay? So even if we're on a even plane of temperature in this air conditioner in the Southern Ocean is, is working, no problem. We still got ocean acidification, we got to worry about our, our health of our oceans, and we still got sea level rise. Okay, and then we're going to have regional effects. So I hope the message coming out of this talk isn't that, you know, the Southern Ocean is going to save us. It might be an explanation for this temporary pause in the warming cycle, but we got all these other serious problems that come along with pumping too much CO2 in the atmosphere. And for those reasons alone, we should, you know, curb emissions. Has there been any research um, about the role of, <coughs> as nations like India and China become more industrialized and their output increases as the United States decreases, um, has there been any research into uh, the effect of aerosols, the aerosols from those particular countries and cooling with that? Yeah, that's a really good question, Michelle. And, um, yeah, as the use of coal in China and particularly India and also South Africa, huge markets, um, increases the, the localized aerosol input is going to have a role. Um, and of course it was much more widespread in the 50s and early 60s because North America and Europe were heavily into coal as well and they had dirty stacks. Um, so as they ramp up, we might see a bigger role for those. I do not believe it was part of the modeling looking at this last decade. It was looked at, but it was not considered to be a major player in this last decade. Not to say it won't in the next decade. It's a very good, very good point. Do you have a question about the states? We, um, you know, we have heard in the headlines in recent years, you know, the the hottest year on record um, since we've been recording Last temperature. Year. Right. So it, are we just saying that it's a very small increment that makes it the hottest year on record and it's still part of that stasis time period? Yeah, last year the global climate report was 2014 was exceeded the warmest year of the last decade. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the global distribution of where it was getting warm, it wasn't happening in North America. Okay, guess where it was happening? The Southern Hemisphere. I was in Punta Arenas a year ago. It was 91 degrees in April. People were swimming in the Strait of Magellan in their blue jeans. They didn't even have shorts. They went in with their pants. No one had ever seen it like that. Temperature records were being broken in South Africa, um, in parts of Australia. So. You know, the Earth doesn't do everything in step. It's like the thermostat in your house. You turn up the thing and the room closest to the furnace is gonna get warm first, or first and so on. So, yeah, last year was, on average, the warmest year on record, but the majority of that heat was in the southern hemisphere. Now, if that trend continues, then, and we're still in the La Nina phase, then we really got some sorting out to do. <coughs> 
Thanks for coming out.